Oral questions by members. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, we know, based on government's own documents, that the NDP Clean BC scheme is a financial disaster that will be ripping $11,000 per year out of people's household income by 2030. And while half of British Columbians are $200 or less a month away from paying their bills and food bank usage is soaring, this government is recklessly funneling untold dollars into the Clean BC, the misleading Clean BC advertising. Just one aspect of this advertising to consider, Mr. Speaker, the government is spending $22,000 for a mere 30 second TV ads during the Canucks games, multiple ads during every game. That's $700 for every second spent on misleading Clean BC advertisements. How can the Premier justify blowing $700 a second on Clean BC TV ads when countless people are hanging on by a thread struggling to pay their own bills and needing to rely on food banks in BC? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. British Columbians have made it absolutely clear that they're deeply concerned about climate change and they want to know what our government is doing about it. We are giving British Columbians that information because they are feeling the effects of climate change. Every time there's extreme heat, every time people are evacuated from their communities due to wildfire, every time the agriculture industry is threatened by drought or by flooding, we are taking action on climate change. We're sharing what we're doing with British Columbians. We're building a strong plan and we'll continue to do that. Kamloops Northampton Supplemental. Well, the minister might want to watch his own commercials because it certainly does not point out that Clean BC has missed every single climate target that it has set for itself over the last few years. Simple fact, Mr. Speaker, is it is transformed into a cost BC plan. It's costing more and achieving nothing. Yet this NDP government burns through $700 every second on a hockey game ad in a misleading campaign trying to uh, change the narrative on a disastrous cost BC scheme. In the time, Mr. Speaker, it takes the Canucks to have a power play this government spends $90,000 on these ads alone. It's no wonder that since 2018, the NDP has more than doubled their advertising budget. As British Columbians suffer from the NDP's middle class squeeze, how much taxpayer money has the Premier squandered on not just the $700 a second Canucks ads, but the cost BC advertising overall. Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Honourable Speaker, we've made tremendous progress in reducing emissions in British Columbia. We exceeded our target for the take-up of light-duty zero-emission vehicles. We are supporting British Columbians to install heat pumps so they will both save money and be more comfortable. We are ahead of our methane emission reduction <clears throat> targets. The only target that was missed was the 2020 target set by those people on that side of the House when they were on this side of the House and their emissions rose. Emissions have been going down steadily since 2017 in actual terms. Members, 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 members. Emissions have been going down since 2017 in absolute terms and even more on a per capita basis. We're staying the course because climate action is important to British Columbia, both for our security and economically. Opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that this uh, Premier isn't just flooding uh, TV advertising during Canucks games. His government is blitzing primetime uh, media slots on radio and TV, spending millions of dollars on media markets, promoting Cost BC all across British Columbia. And the Premier is doing it, all the while not owning up and being transparent about the massive negative impacts of Cost BC on family incomes and thousands of jobs, and oh, by the way, that emissions are actually going up under this government. Now, as the Premier doubles the government's taxpayer-funded propaganda budget, NDP insiders are lining their pockets 
through the COST BC campaign. Let's talk about the NOW group. This is a, a group that is closely allied with the NDP that's been reaping substantial fees for spearheading this expensive COST BC propaganda. So my question to the Premier is this, how can the Premier look British, Columbians, uh, British Columbia taxpayers in the eyes, people who are struggling, and defend prioritizing lucrative deals for high-priced NDP consultants over the economic well-being of British Columbia families who are set to lose $11,000 per family per year? Shame. Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the analysis is simply wrong because the analysis assumes that there was no climate action in British Columbia since 2017 or that there would be none. And that would only have been true if those members were on this side of the House doing nothing. Not only, not only have we taken Not only have we taken effective action to reduce emissions, and emissions have gone down, Mr. Speaker, we have taken significant actions to make life cheaper for British Columbians in ways that the opposition has voted against every single time, whether it was ICBC rate reductions, whether it was eliminating MSP premiums, whether it was Members. supporting childcare and the child family benefit increase, we are taking action to support families Members. in BC and we are building a strong clean energy economy because that's where the world is going and that's where we're going too because BC United and BC Conservatives would simply leave British Columbia behind. Opposition House Leader Supplemental. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, seven years in and not a single emissions target has been met by this government. And uh, I'll tell you actually the difference between Cost BC and uh, the Vancouver Canucks. At least the Canucks are, are hitting their goals. Yeah. Now, now, now communications, now communications group now Communications Group has been amassing millions from NDP government communication Members. contracts and NDP caucus advertising. The Premier's appointment of Marie Della Mattia, former president of Now Communications, now as Deputy Minister of Government Communications, has only increased the flow of taxpayer money for high-gloss cost BC propaganda. This blatant political payola is fueling the $700 a second cost BC advertising blitz during Canucks games, even as BC families grapple with the worst affordability in the entire country. So again, to the Premier, why is the Premier funneling taxpayer funds to his political cronies and splurging $700 a second on ads aimed at peddling a cost BC scheme, all the while not being straight up with British Columbians about the massive negative impacts of cost BC on family incomes and private sector jobs in every corner of British Columbia. Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. You know, 15 years ago, the then BC Liberal Party believed that climate change was real and we should do something about it. They introduced a carbon tax. The leader of uh, BCU said it was one of the proudest moments that he had in government. It is, it is really unfortunate, Honourable Members. Speaker, that the official opposition in the Conservative Party would have British Columbians believe that climate change doesn't matter. Members, members will come to order now. Members, please. Member? Minister has the floor. We know that if they were on this side of the House, they would rip up the plan and do nothing. It would cost BC businesses and individuals hugely. It would make communities insecure, and it would leave British Columbia behind in the kind of clean energy investments that we saw just last week with an investment in E1 Mali and the creation of over 400 jobs in Maple Ridge. That's what we're doing on this side of the House. That's what we're going to keep doing on this side of the House. And that's what British Columbians expect and want. Thank you. 
members, as I reminded yesterday, let's hear the question and also please let's hear the answer as well. Okay? House Leader of Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, my colleague asked about uh, the lack of accountability and oversight in the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Child welfare workers uh, in this province have extraordinary powers to remove children from their families. Based on an allegation, they can walk into anyone's house and decide to remove children. This BCNDP government doesn't even require the MCFD social workers to be regulated under the College of Social Workers, protecting the families, protecting the social workers, Mr. Speaker. British Columbians have reason to be deeply concerned. The public needs to have trust in the system, and the Minister and the senior staff continue to fail us. Mr. Speaker, we spend $135,000 per child per year in care. Poverty is a primary driver of children being removed from their families. To the Premier, wouldn't it be more compassionate and make more economic sense to spend the money on keeping children in their homes with their families than diverting these funds uh, and diverting these funds to the families in need? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. And uh, this will give me an opportunity to respond to the questions uh, raised by the leader of the Green Party yesterday as well that were referenced in uh, the member's question. Uh, as the member will know, uh, changes were made to raise standards in 2019. All people working for the ministry are expected to uh, live up and work to the highest standards uh, as public servants and under the Child, Family and Community Services Act. In addition to that, Honourable Speaker, uh, the members will know, and I know this is an issue in particular of interest uh, to the leader of the Green Party, because I know because she has raised it with me in the past, the regulation of social workers in uh, British Columbia. I'd say that there is a broad engagement going on and has, is going on right now around the oversight of all social workers in British Columbia that included over 200 participants in 32 sessions with 1,700 survey responses. And we should expect a response and information about that early in the new year from the Ministry of Children and Families. So the issues raised uh, by the members around those questions of qualifications and of social workers and of colleges, those issues that are part of and part of how we're responding to that is reaching out and, and uh, talking to the community of social workers. Member Supplemental. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, in, and I appreciate the Minister's response. Um, but in the response, uh, there is an expectation uh, that social workers meet standards, um, as, as uh, paraphrasing what the Minister just said. However, by the, our own audits, by the own audits of the Ministry of Children and Family Development, by the reports, the constant reports from the representative of children and youth, we're not meeting those standards. We haven't been meeting those standards for five, six, seven, for decades, Mr. Speaker. And rather than creating layers of transparency and accountability, this government has failed to give social workers and to give families that are impacted by the decisions that social workers make a basic level of protection. What other industry in this province where we would uh, put the, the care of our children, the care of our people, the care of our seniors without a regulated industry? Only the most vulnerable children in our province to get that kind of special treatment, Mr. Speaker. And it's not a kind of special treatment that we need to be celebrating uh, in this House. You know, when a social worker walks in to, the, to a, a, a family's house, they're given basically one tool, and that is to remove the child. And yet we know that $135,000 is invested uh, in each child per year per care. Mr. Speaker. Through you to the minister, when is this government going to provide child welfare workers with a more diverse set of tools so they can actually support the families that are in need? Minister of Health. Honourable Speaker, um, I would argue that we are doing that and we must do that. And uh, the very significant investments and supports provided in the system, the profound and historic work that is being done and must continue to be done 
with Indigenous communities shows that. And I think in this process, and these are issues, and I'm very respectful of the questions provided because these are issues raised, the member will know that social workers are obviously important workers in health authorities as well as of the Ministry of Children and Family Development. So the expectation of high standards of frontline workers, all frontline workers, whether they're social workers or not, is an expectation. So we have to do exactly the kind of things that the member's talking about, and we also have to engage with our community of workers to make sure that they have the skills necessary to do the work. And that's what this process is about, and I think it's the process that we're engaging in right now is about. I expect that there'll be a role uh, for members of the legislature. I will endeavor to ensure that uh, the member and his colleague are kept fully informed about what happens, and I know that the Minister of Children and Families will do so as well. House Leader of the Fourth Party. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Anda Kindi, the Conservative Party of British Columbia's candidate for North Island, recently told me about a patient she saw at her clinic in Campbell River. This patient was a teenager in high school who is, to this very day, addicted to safe supply drugs. Drugs, I would remind everyone in this House that this NDP government is buying from its former provincial health officer. The kids call them dillies. Mr. Kindley asked this teenager how many of his fellow students were addicted to these deadly safe supply drugs. He told her at least 30. 30. As a grandfather, I worry that my own grandson will be peer pressured into trying these safe supply drugs one day. He's almost 12 now, and I know he has lots of support at home, but this is the reality of what's happening in our schools under this NDP government. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, my question, as a father, what age does he think is appropriate for children to encounter these drugs in our streets or school system, and if, God forbid, his own child became addicted to these drugs, would he encourage them to keep using safe supply, or would he get them into a rehabilitation program? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And I'll, uh, I'll thank the, the, the member for raising uh, what I know is a concern uh, for everyone in this House, for everyone across our health care system, for frontline care providers with respect to, the, uh, to, to, to challenges for children and youth with respect to mental health and substance use issues in, in, in these times. And I would say that, you know, when it comes to how we are addressing uh, a, a public health emergency that has taken the lives of over 13,100 people so far since it was declared in 2016, over 1,800 British Columbians so far this year, is that we have to work across the entire continuum. We have to work very hard to ensure that we are keeping people alive while we are connecting them to care and support. And with respect to what are some very challenging circumstances on the ground in Campbell River, and I've had a chance to go to Campbell River and meet with care providers, meet with doctors. I am uh, so grateful for the work that uh, our public health uh, officers are doing in that part of the island, uh, what frontline doctors and nurses um, are doing to support uh, individuals who are struggling with substance use. Uh, I would say, though, uh, however, uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, the member is just wrong uh, with respect to uh, what he is suggesting as, as fact in, uh, with respect to, to, uh, to, to sources of, 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 of drugs. I mean, that, that, that's just, it's just wrong that there is a, a, a connection to Fear Pharma here. Member Supplemental. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, we are all parents grandparents and mentors here. And any of those in our charge, if any of those in our charge became addicted to drugs, safe supply or not, I am certain that each member here would do everything that they could to get that child or young person into a rehabilitation program. But the reality is, working class British Columbians, the ones whose children are most likely to be targeted by predatory dealers and safe supply pushers, wait months to get their kids into treatment. And make no mistake, children die waiting for access to those beds and facilities. For example, Greg Sword in Port Coquitlam, whose daughter Camilla was told by a drug counselor that she could keep using marijuana to deal with her anxiety at the age of 13, 
died from an overdose of NDP safe supply drugs at the age of 14. The drugs that killed Camilla were bought for by addicts, by the NDP, all paid for with money taken from hard-working BC taxpayers. My question, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, how many more parents like Greg Sword will have to bury their teenage children because of this NDP's failed safe supply policy? Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. There is uh, no one in this House, no one in any of our communities that wants to see youth struggling with addiction, struggling with mental health issues. That is why we are working so hard across our health care system with experts, with our uh, colleagues in education and child care, with our colleagues in MCFD, to ensure that we have the kinds of uh, systems in place and pathways to care for youth to support them when they are experiencing mental health and substance use issues. It's why we've spent uh, so much investing in upstream supports, ex massively expanding access to primary and mental health care through our foundry system, which is low barrier care for youth aged 12 to 24. It's why we're working with education to build integrated child and youth uh, mental health teams that go to, go to where kids are at and wrap services around them so that we can ensure that we are building the pathways to care that youth need in order to provide the support. And we will continue to do that work uh, across government with a whole of government approach. Member for Abbotsford West. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, not only is the Premier and the government embarking upon a, a climate plan that is failing to deliver on emissions targets, there is now a growing list of reputable analysts who relying on the government's own methodology are predicting economic disaster uh, that will follow uh, from this plan. Ken Peacock isn't just the senior economist for the BC Business Council. He's also a long-standing member of this government's Economic Forecast Council. The Premier and the uh, Environment Minister are doing everything they can to discredit him and his analysis, we just heard it again from the minister earlier today, which is based exclusively on material produced by the government. That modeling says that this cost BC plan will lead to the BC economy by sh shrinking by upwards of $28 billion in the next six years and the loss of tens of thousands of jobs. My question to the Premier is, why is he so intent on hiding the truth about the devastating impact this cost BC plan will have for families in BC? Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The truth about devastating impacts to BC is this. In 2021, Extreme weather cost the BC economy $17 billion in that year alone. This year, this past year, the costs of wildfire fighting were over a billion dollars in this year alone. People are losing homes, people are losing businesses, people are losing a sense of security. And contrary to what the member opposite claims, our plan is reducing emissions steadily. We expect it to reduce emissions more as the programs we put into place take root. That's what British Columbians need. And an analysis that is taken out of context, that assumes that somehow magically uh, BCU was still in power and did nothing about climate change as they had for the previous six years, and therefore, it's apple to orange. Honourable Speaker, we have built a strong economy in BC. It's the strongest in Canada. We're going to continue our work. Member for Abbotsford West Supplemental. 
Mr. Speaker. Well, not surprisingly, Mr. Peacock has been listening carefully to what the Minister and the, uh, the government uh, have had to say. Uh, yesterday, he wrote to the Minister. And uh, in his six-page letter, he uh, dissects what the Minister has been attempting to do in dismissing his own uh, government's fine. He dissects it point by point. Page uh, three of the letter. He, uh, the Minister stands up. He has repeatedly in this House and says, well, look, there's going to be all these new economic opportunities that are going to be sufficient to offset the loss of $28 billion. But Mr. Peacock says to the Minister yesterday, we have been unable to find support for these statements in the methodology report. That's the Minister's methodology report. Nowhere does the Minister's methodology report suggest that uncertainty about the future energy economy should be taken to mean that there are large, unambiguously positive economic gains for BC that are missing from the modelling and can be assumed to negate its findings. Mr. Speaker, it appears this NDP government has rediscovered the lost NDP art of injecting optimism <laughs> into economic forecasts when they don't like what the real numbers say, Mr. Speaker. The Minister just last week in this House said, quote, the comparison in the clean BC, and I think he just said it again a moment ago, Quote, the comparison in the Clean BC documents were of the Clean BC plan against no climate plan whatsoever, which is what existed in 2017, and quote, quote, the problem with the Minister's statement is it's not true. It's not not true because I say so. It's not not true because Ken Peacock says so. It's not true because in the Minister's own methodology, they list 14 initiatives that were in place in 2017 when the government changed, Mr. Speaker. Government is doing everything it can to dismiss and discredit this report. They're spending millions of dollars on advertising to discredit this analysis and this report. Mr. Speaker, there is a $28 billion gap between what this minister is saying and what a long-standing respected member of the government's own Economic Forecast Council is saying. My question is to the Finance Minister. Who's right? Minister of Environment. Honourable Speaker, the members opposite unfortunately think that the time for climate action isn't here and that it's not happening in BC and that it's not happening around the globe, but in fact, the exact opposite is happening, Honourable Speaker. The United States Inflation Reduction Act is injecting $3 trillion in investment in renewable energy and renewable energy technologies. British Columbia is positioning itself to be a leader in both those fields and to take advantage of those investments. Honourable Speaker, we've seen E1 Mali, 450 permanent jobs, over $1 billion invested. But here's the facts that the members opposite don't like. The economic facts about our record in government. Our GDP growth since 2017 is the highest in Canada among large provinces, and our unemployment rate is the lowest in Canada. Member for Prince George Wilmont. Well, one fact we know that is absolutely clear is that under this Premier's watch, British Columbia has become the most unaffordable jurisdiction in the country, bar none. That, that is this Minister's record, and he can stand in this Legislature day after day and dismiss and try to discredit experts. But let's be clear, they are using this government's own documents. And in fact, his arguments, the minister's arguments, make zero sense. By any single measure, this plan will cost BC. And what will it cost BC? Well, in fact, BC families will get $11,000 cut from their household income every single year. And the minister smiles and thinks that f that's funny. It's not to families in British Columbia who are making a decision about whether to feed their kids or fill their gas tanks. That's this government's record. So with income plunging for families, essential services at risk, will the Premier do the right thing, stop 
blowing millions of dollars on misleading ads that are going to cost British Columbians? Will he do the right thing and for once start protecting the livelihoods of British Columbia's families? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> Honourable Speaker, uh, we've had a, a long exchange for the last couple of days. Um, but what's troubling about this entire exchange, Honourable Speaker, is the trend we've seen throughout this session. What we've seen throughout this session is uh, a complete flip flop every members, single time, Honourable Speaker. Members, Honorable Speaker, members. He hasn't even started yet, members. Wait. Members. Minister. Honorable Speaker, um, we have seen so many flip-flops. It's unbelievable. First, they support the Surrey police transition. Then the BC, Con BC Conservative Party says we're against it. They switch their position, Honorable Speaker. We bring in short-term... Members, members, members. We bring in legislation to get more housing back in the housing market. They support it. The BC Conservatives go the other way. Then they switch their tune, honorable speaker. When we talk about harm reduction, they said they support it. BC Conservatives switch their position. They switch their position. Honorable speaker, now, now a party. Members, 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 members. It's almost over. Just a few more seconds. Take it easy. Almost over. Almost over. Let him answer. Minister has the floor. Honorable Speaker. The party that founded the carbon tax, the party that decided that they wanted to be leaders on climate action, now because of the BC Conservatives, are completely switching, Honourable Speaker. What's clear to us is they will say anything to get elected next election, Honourable Speaker. They have no principles, they have no values, they believe in nothing but trying to win the election. We're going to continue to fight against that every single day, Honourable Speaker. The bell and the question period.